Hello, welcome to our talk, Fails in Data Encoding for Concept Inventory and Development and in Digital and in Analog Data. Well, actually, the, <laughs> the whole title is a big fail already because I'm not a native speaker, as you might hear, but actually I really try to fail for you. If you are a Concept Inventory developer and um, don't want to make the same mistakes, please listen to this talk. And I hope to hear about your fails or almost fails, um, things you considered in the end as well, or just put it in the chat there. Okay, let's start. Why is this important? Even recent literature states that this is a widely neglected topic. So here's the agenda. First, I'm gonna talk about my biggest fails in data encoding and transformation and what metadata might be useful to save this. Second, um, I'm going to talk about how to measure encoding reliability in several ways. So don't. These are the don'ts or takeaways I made from my experience. Don't throw away data early. <laughs> it sounds stupid as it is, but I really did. And don't assume simple things as easy. But out of this phase also, we developed some techniques that we would like to share with you. So we will tell you how to measure your encoding reliability, how to aim for sufficient encoding redundancy, and how to estimate the remaining coding error probability. Okay, back to the don'ts. Don't throw away data early. Just three little checkboxes I missed. And yeah, so not all the data got exported and I only exported the finishers. Tiny mistake, big result. Then I thought about, okay, how can I at least measure how big this error is? So I have the metadata of survey participants. So I see on which page they abandoned the survey. And you can clearly see that um, after page three, it drops dramatically and then it pretty much stays constant. But the really valuable data you take for concept inventory development is the data beyond 50% or more, the data that you could impute. So that's actually not that much. All in all, if you count from page 13, there were just 14 participants I lost. It's still a pain, but yeah, well, it's passed. <laughs> the second learning I took from that is that if you have one or two or three questions that are particularly iffy still and you want to get a lot of data about it just put it in the first three things we decided on something else we decided to put their very motivating questions in the hope that more participants actually take the whole survey also you can see the non-response bias here 432 participants opened the survey and 132 <coughs> proceeded to the next page so never underestimate the value of your firsts consent page. Okay, next learning. Simple things are not easy because simple things are boring. Our brain is just not made for encoding A, B, C, D, two, one, two, three, four, a couple of thousand times. So we thought about, okay, how can we introduce some very American invention that actually, yeah, the allies brought to Germany? Uh, checks and balances principle. Okay, how did we get reliable data? First of all, we used a coding mask to make it really easy for coders. Yeah, just type the data, hit enter. Don't think about where to put the data. Second, we let recode everything. Yeah, you saw that a slide before. Um, the number of coded booklets was recoded by actually four coders. Third, look up all coding differences. So after we kind of had everything recoded, of course, Sometimes you see coding differences and every single coding difference was looked up and that gave us the advantage also to decide on, okay, who, which coder made the mistake. If you triple code, sometimes it's not even clear. So we call that the SEEDMAT method. Um, SEEDMAT stands for Semi-Automatic Encoding Error Detection for Manual Encoded Data. This was important because now we can calculate the encoding reliability of each coder. So here's how we calculate that. And these are actually fairly realistic values. Yeah, every 200 codings, your brain just makes a mistake. But I was not yet satisfied. Now I wanted to know how many errors can I still expect in the survey data? 
So that's pretty much the probability that both coders make a mistake at the same place. So with 2000 coded variables, that will result in 0.075 expected errors that are still remaining undetected. This is a most conservative approach because we still didn't yet consider that you have to fail in exactly the same way. Um, so miscode A with B or something. So both coders have to do that in order to produce an undetectable coding error. And then still that coding error needs to result in a scoring error. Yeah, if you confuse a wrong answer with a wrong answer, it's still not going to affect the scores. But what do we do with that not zero expected errors now? Well, it's a very small value, so you could say, I'll just consider my data as robust. But that's not what I did. I rounded up to one and recalculated the reliability analysis with one mistake. So how do I harm my analysis, or in this case, reliability analysis, the most effective way? For one, the question is pretty straightforward. Just take the highest scoring person and the best question and invert the scores there. Best working question means in this case um, the one with the highest item total correlation. If you want to implement two arrows, it gets a little bit more iffy. Either you have two highest scoring persons or you can harm your reliability analysis the best if you take your best two questions and invert scores there. Yes, these are my fails in concept inventory development. I hope to hear yours and thank you for your time and thank you for your questions. There or there. I don't know. <laughs>